Yeah, the, the pre-COVID ALS period was really amazing. It was really a new period in ALS where there was so much more hope. You know, with really thousands of people studying this illness all over the world, you know, global collaborations, meetings really every week. You could be at an ALS meeting somewhere in the world pretty much all the time. And, you know, you know, 160 companies in the space. There was really this energy that we were finally putting this puzzle together of what causes ALS and how to approach it. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Connecting ALS. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Stevenson, and thanks to the power of technology, I'm joined by my co-host, Jeremy Holden in North Carolina. Mr. Holden, how are you doing today? Doing great, Mike. How about you? Not bad, not bad. Uh, Jeremy, we're, we're starting to see some loosening of restrictions and guidelines related to the pandemic in various states across the country now that we're in the middle of May. And we hope that uh, everyone out there is, is taking necessary precautions to keep themselves and their loved ones safe as there's still a lot of unknowns. Yeah, we are. And, you know, we're, we're seeing that down here in North Carolina. And I've been following the news. You know, I grew up in Ohio, so seeing what's happening there and just really all over the country, states are kind of trying to figure out the extent to which that we can start opening some of the aspects of society that maybe we shut down. I think you said it right, Mike, you know, trusting people to continue to stay vigilant and understand that we're, we're not out of this yet. And certainly, you know, what our community is, is well aware that, you know, there are vulnerable populations that even as we start to open up some aspects of society might not be able to fully participate in some of those things, especially if people aren't being smart about it and, and continuing to wear masks when necessary, recognize the, those kind of six feet parameters and, and just, you know, engage in some of the, the social necessities that are still going to be in place, even if we start to open up some of the businesses and loosen some of those restrictions. Right. And, and we're hopeful, you know, that, that things are improving and that we are on kind of a slow upswing, uh, but we don't know yet. We're, we're certainly not out of the woods. And for those of us affiliated with ALS, our focus remains on uh, sustaining the progress we've made towards meaningful treatments for the disease. And we've been getting a lot of questions at the ALS Association and at the chapter level about how COVID-19 is impacting research and, and labs all over the world. And we've had a few guests that have touched on the subject, but this week, we're, we're really excited to be bringing you an interview with one of the biggest names and most influential figures in global ALS research. I'm talking about Dr. Merit Sakovich from Mass General and Harvard Medical School on the East Coast. Many of you listening probably uh, have followed her work at some point, and if you haven't, uh, I'll encourage you to take a look at the link we'll include in our show notes regarding her ongoing research. But Jeremy, really, really valuable to hear from someone so entrenched in ALS studies like Dr. Sakovich. Absolutely. And, you know, Mass General announced the platform trial, the first ever platform trial in ALS was set to really kind of get off the ground right at the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, hearing from her about the way that they had to reassess and adjust what they were doing with the platform trial, but just with research in general, how does research continue going? How do new things like the platform trial get off the ground in this time of social distancing? That's right. The Healy platform trial, a big step forward for ALS research and all neurological research. And uh, Dr. Sakovich will explain it all in a much more eloquent way than Jeremy or I ever could. So let's listen now to our interview with Dr. Merit Sakovich. We are joined on the phone today by Dr. Merit Sakovich. Uh, she is the director of the Sean M. Healy and AMG Center for ALS, the chief of neurology at Mass General in Boston, the director of the Neurological Clinical Research Institute, and the Julianne Dorn Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. She is also the co-founder and former co-chair of the uh, Northeast ALS Consortium, also known as NEALS. Doctor, I could probably spend the bulk of the show reading uh, all of your accolades, but <laughs> all the more reason that we are thrilled to have you with us today on the Connecting ALS. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and, and we're going to be asking you about how things are going at Mass General and your present day work in just a few minutes. But let's first maybe rewind, if we can, to a pre-pandemic period of time prior to March of 2020 this year, what, in your opinion, was the overall state of ALS research and, and maybe what you were most encouraged by in terms of ongoing studies that you're connected to? 
Yeah, the, the pre-COVID ALS period was really amazing. It was really a new period in ALS where there was so much more hope, you know, with really thousands of people studying this illness all over the world, you know, global collaborations, meetings really every week. You could be at an ALS meeting somewhere in the world pretty much all the time. And, you know, you know, 160 companies in the space. There was really this energy that we were finally putting this puzzle together of what causes ALS and how to approach it. And, you know, actually right before the lockdown, many of us were at an ALS meeting in Baltimore where we spent three days just talking about ALS science and hope and targets. So it was really had a lot of momentum. So from that moment in Baltimore to where we are today, you, you referenced the lockdown, some of the quarantine measures that are in place throughout the country. How does that impact your work and, and ALS research generally? What, what's the state of affairs right now? Well, it's a, it's a big change, but uh, as an internal optimist, I think a lot of good is actually going to come from it. All those same people that were studying ALS before and caring for patients are as passionate about it. We just had to evolve our way of communicating with each other and communicating with our patients so that we don't didn't lose any time. And so some of the good things I think that have come out of it is that almost all the ALS centers now have quickly adopted telehealth as a way to stay connected and care for their patients in their home. We were able to quickly adapt many of our trials to be virtual. And this was you know something we had thought about doing before, but the regulations and the ability to do it weren't there. And all of a sudden we could do this. And just for an example, we have three clinical trials where we made them entirely virtual, including getting consent, shipping the drug to the home. So in a way, it enabled us to think in a more, even more patient-centered way of how we can keep research going for our patients. And so it wasn't like it, it happened overnight and it wasn't that it wasn't hard to do, but it, it happened and it happened all over the United States. So that gives me you know, hope that those changes, even though they were driven by the pandemic, will be here to stay and allow us to make it easier for people with ALS to be part of research. Right. Thank you for that, you know, that optimistic outlook and really kind of the update on where you see things going from here in ALS research. We've been getting kind of anecdotally and in social media questions about how the pandemic and research being done there and, and the work being done on finding a vaccine should impact or potentially drive urgency in other forms of medical research. Do you see any sort of benefit there in some of the work that's being done globally as the whole world tries to figure out COVID? Is there learnings there that we can say, let's try and apply more of this to what's being done on the ALS side? I, I realize it's a lot more complicated than that, but is there any kind of big takeaways there? I think there are a few takeaways. I think uh, one, you can see that when there is a global problem, you can mobilize resources from governments, from industry, from philanthropy to move things faster. And in a way, the field was doing that in ALS. We've had a lot of positive shifts in, you know, with an FDA guidance document that ALS Association uh, led and and other initiatives. But this shows us that really by working together as a community to say, this is an important problem. How, what are the barriers? How can we move forward? We, we could probably move things even faster. We're also in a way benefiting from those kind of changes in regulations. You know, for example, on the telehealth part, it used to be that you really couldn't do some of those tele visits across state lines or you couldn't get insurance to cover it. All that is now, uh, it's okay to do that. And so that's okay for COVID patients. It's also okay for you know people with ALS. So that helps us on the research. The other thing I would say is pharma companies and biotech companies were deemed essential. So they didn't shut down. And a lot of them had ongoing ALS research. And in a way, because of COVID and people were not traveling so much for meetings, they had more availability for you know ALS meetings virtually. So in a way, people have been more productive on the research and more connected in, you know, the academics talking to companies and talking to patients about how we can move therapies forward. I'm struck by your observation about clinical trials moving into kind of a distance or virtual space or how we're, we're continuing some clinical trials during this time of social distancing. And you, you talk a bit about telehealth and how that is allowing some services to move forward. 
coming out of COVID, what are the limits in terms of what trials can happen in a distance type setting versus having to continue with more traditional go to the clinic type of a setup? Every trial will probably still need some in-person visits. It's important to have a relationship with the patient or the doctor and to be sure of the diagnosis. And that still requires an in-person visit. But if, let's say, a drug is oral or you know, it can be taken by mouth, it could be that the rest of the visits are done remotely. But for treatments that have to be given in the vein or in the spinal fluid space or where you need more close observation, those still might need to be done at the, at the hospital setting. But I do think that's very feasible. I, I think one thing we've learned from COVID is that actually hospitals are very safe. They, with the right protective equipment for the patient and their family and the doctors and the staff, you know, the transmission in the hospital is very low. It's actually much higher in the community. So I do think it's safe for patients to come back to the hospitals and to get care But we still should be thinking about what's the easiest thing for the patient in the trial. And if we can save them time driving in or effort coming in and do things in their home, I think that in the long run, that'll be better for the patients. Thanks for that overview. It'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out and and hearing from someone in your position about ways that we can implement some of these newer pieces and telehealth and differences in the clinical setting. I think it's fascinating. And I'm sure those living with ALS and their loved ones look forward to when we reach that time, the new normal, so to speak. Doctor, as someone who co-founded and remains deeply involved with the Northeast ALS Consortium, which uh, some of our listeners uh, do recognize uh, as the network of more than 100 international clinical sites performing collaborative ALS research. What do you believe is the greatest benefit of that group and groups like it, aside from obviously having all of those brilliant minds working together uh, in the fight against ALS? You know, the Niels group and kind of being part of that and seeing it grow has been one of my, the pleasures of my career. And it's a meeting that I always love to go to and a group I'd love to work with. I like to think of it as this collective genius where you get people that come together from all sorts of other different fields. And we, we have our patients, their families, the lung doctors, the nurses, the researchers, the ALS docs. And it's an open forum of just sharing ideas. And, you know, there's this love of talking about science and the love of coming up with new ideas and then somebody taking off with it. So I'd like to give an example, like once we were talking about how how important it was to have the patient voice in clinical trials. And from that came this idea of this clinical research learning institute that Dr. Bedlack now runs, where, you know, over 200 people with ALS have been taught about FDA rules and trials and and now those research, we call them research ambassadors, they're talking to companies about the patient input and design. They're talking to the FDA about what's important to patients. And that came from, you know, an idea at a Niels conference. So there is enormous value of having these collaborative groups that get together and, they, and you have fun. Like you're not just listening to a lecture, you're schmoozing, and you're sharing what you're doing and great ideas come from that. It's also great to see it happening elsewhere. You know, there's now a a group in Asia called PACT ALS, Pan-Asia ALS, and they invited me and a few others to their initial meeting, and they said they want to be like Niels, but in in Asia. And now we have collaborations, you know, across the world. So, you know, people have seen the value of people working together for for such a serious illness. You, You have to be working together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and nothing speaks more to the success of a model than it being replicated and seen by others as as the model that they want to adopt, you know, where they are and where, and where they're working. You know, I want to go back to the time maybe before COVID really started shutting things down. There was a lot of excitement in the ALS community about the Healy platform trial. What can you tell us about platform trials generally and why it's exciting to bring that model into the world of ALS research. I'm so excited about this way of of doing trials and we are hoping to be enrolling in June. So uh, despite the, uh, the pandemic. So the idea of a platform trial is when you have a big pipeline of treatments to bring forward for a disease, if you test them one by one, 
it'll take an enormous amount of time to get to successful treatments. But if you build an infrastructure where you can test multiple drugs and the same infrastructure, and you can be perpetually adding new drugs to that platform, you can cut down the time to finding effective treatments by 50%, which is huge, and you can cut the cost by a third, and you can increase the chance of patients getting active treatment by two thirds. So it's completely makes sense if we're where ALS is right now. And we got the idea actually from the FDA. Uh, Janet Woodcock had written an article for the New England Journal of Medicine where she encouraged companies and academics to think about these platform trials as a faster, uh, more cost-effective and better for patient approach. And we're, we thought like, why not ALS? Yeah, we have 160 companies. It'll, it'll be uh, 50 years if we go one by one. And we got the buy-in and we're uh, really, really excited to finally be very close to starting. That's excellent news. Do you see, Doctor, at platform trials being a large part of the future of ALS research or is it more at this stage, you know, something that we're going to try out and weigh in on the results and then determine, you know, how much of this sort of work will be done moving forward? I personally think it's going to be the way forward, not just for ALS, but for many neurological illnesses. And, you know, we're, we're really just at the beginning in neurology for this approach, but it's been so successful in oncology. And I see it as many platform trials that, for example, there might be a platform trial for a genetic form of the illness, or there might be a, a platform trial for all the drugs that target TDP43. It's just, it brings enormous efficiency and really for the patient, it gives them a much greater chance of being an active drug. And the other advantage is that it allows you to keep learning about an illness. So in a platform trial, you can build in biomarkers or other research so that you can continuously improve how you do things. And that becomes knowledge that belongs to the whole field and not to an individual company. Oh, that's great. Again, thank you for that description. And I think there's a lot there uh, for folks to be excited about. Uh, Merritt, those were the, the bulk of the questions we wanted to get through with you. Uh, was there anything that you feel like we haven't covered or you wanted to make sure that we got in or, or any element of your work that you want to uh, promote or discuss? So, you know, for the platform trial, we were hoping to start end of March. And then as, as you know, COVID hit. And in the way we've COVID proofed the platform trial in the last two months. Mm. So we've built in ways again to do some of the visits at home. And we had to build in a way to actually assess our patients' breathing status in the home. Because of right. COVID, we can't actually do that in the clinic anymore. So we've we found a way to do it with a home device. And I think this is also going to change how trials are done, but it's going to be a way to also improve care as we find ways in to assess our patients in the home and be more proactive about their care. So again, I think there's a, you know, some good that's come out of, you know, this, this awful pandemic. And then I, I wanted to touch on the lab-based research. You know, so I, I think, as, as you know, that a lot of in, most universities had to shut down the labs and that affected a lot of the ALS scientists. But the good news is those are now reopening. You know, already, uh, you know, this week at Mass General, they're reopening and other universities the same. It's going to be a slow reopening, but it's a sign of hope that that science can also be restarted because we need both. We need the trials, but we need our lab-based colleagues doing their discovery. That is very good news. I know there have been uh, concerns about uh, the momentum and progress slowing in, in all of medical research really around the world. But uh, for those close to ALS, you know, concerned that we would lose a little bit of the steam that we had. So it's great to hear that those labs are reopening and that scientists and doctors are able to begin their work again and, and push forward uh, at this time when we really wouldn't want to lose any of that valuable uh, momentum we had in ALS research. No, not at all. Everybody is as committed as before and eager eager to see each other as well. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you again uh, so much, Dr. Merit Sakovich, for uh, your time today and for this enlightening look uh, into the state of ALS research and kind of what we can expect coming out of the pandemic and then also the exciting work being done on the Healy Platform trial there in Boston. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I remain inspired and hopeful for the future for all our patients. 
Well, thank you again to Dr. Merit Zikovic at Mass General for that insightful conversation, a look at the state of ALS research, the Healy Platform trial, and some hope for the future and where things go from here and, and maybe some things that we learn coming out of the quarantine and how that maybe can inform the way we approach research going forward. Fascinating conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. I agree, Jeremy. It was refreshing to hear some optimism when she spoke about reopening the labs and picking up essentially right where they left off from a clinical trial perspective. So it's really, it's nice to hear that. And I'm sure that will bring a smile to the faces of many folks listening to the podcast. All right, that's going to conclude this episode of Connecting ALS. As always, we would appreciate it if you would subscribe to the show, either at connectingals.org or really anywhere you listen to podcasts. And if you found us on social media to share your uh, feedback about the show or uh, ask us questions, that would be great. We are on Facebook and Twitter. You can find us there. This episode was produced by Garrett Tiedemann of the Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter of the ALS Association. Thank you all for listening, and we will connect with you again very soon. Music.